Good morning, church. It's good to see everyone. We got a great audience this morning. Folks that are joining us online, we're happy to have you as well. We're just excited to be here today to have an opportunity to worship our God. And I hope you've come ready to do that. I hope you've had a chance to look at the handout and uh, uh, be aware of the things that are happening and going on here. I hope that you'll plan to participate in all of those activities. But we're excited about God and what God is doing in our lives, and we've come here today to praise Him. So get ready to do that. Let's be standing. Michael, continue leading us. We bring sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. We bring sacrifice of praise.
scripture reading. Today's scripture reading comes from Psalms chapter 51, verse 7 through 10. Purify me from my sins, and I'll be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart. O oh God, renew a loyal spirit in me. Amen. Praise God from Let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can call you Father, that we can know you as our God, and know that you love us because that you have given your, your one and only Son to die for us. And Father, we thank you for that love that you've shown to us the love that Christ had for us, that he was willing to, to go to that cross and to bear our sins so that we could have forgiveness of those sins, the sins that plague us each day of our lives. Father, we ask that you would be with us, that we can 
grow stronger in you that we can avoid the sins that so often we commit. And Father, help us to do those things that we should be doing that we leave undone. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you bless us with each day. We thank you for the blessing that we have this day of being able to come together as your children to encourage one another as we worship you. And help us, Father, as we do worship you too, that our worship may be pleasing to you. Father, help us to strengthen one another that each day we can grow stronger and we can assist one another to, to be able to show the love that you have for, for mankind to those that we come in contact with. Father, we would ask you to, to be with us as a congregation. Be with the elders as they lead us. Be with Rick and Justin and the teachers that bring us your word. Father, help us to take your word into our hearts and, and put it into our lives and live it out day by day. Father, we would ask that you would be with uh, so many of our number that are sick or having troubles and issues in their lives, especially if they're in the hospitals or if they're recovering from sickness, Father, be with them and strengthen them and give them a strength that can only come from you. Father, we ask you to be with the world that we live in, be with our leaders that decisions that can be made that would benefit us as we are Christians. Father, that would benefit those and so many of those, uh, even in the Ukraine area and the Russian area that uh, have so much turmoil in their life and even their lives are, uh, are in jeopardy. And Father, we ask that you be uh, a guiding influence in all the decisions that are made. Father, be with our military and the, and the families of our military and the first responders as they assist in protecting us and, and giving us the needed assistance as we need. Father, we ask you to uh, be with us as we uh, remember your Lord's, uh, your son's death in the Lord's table. And Father, be with us as we go through life that each day we can be a stronger Christian, a stronger influence for you. Be with us in all things, for it's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.
As we come to this part of the worship, I'm going to read a scripture that we have read hundreds of times here. It's out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. For I have received from the Lord what I have also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. It's pretty easy to remember, especially after we've sung these songs. We're here together and we have these emblems that represent his body and his blood. The mind is a tremendous thing God created. Everything that we see, everything that we taste, everything that we touch, everything that we hear goes into our mind and then we do something with it. But today, let's talk about where it goes from there to the heart. Okay? The heart is why we remember. The heart is affected as we remember. In the world we live in, there's a lot to consume that goes into our mind. Where are we going for lunch? What about my loved ones in the hospital? There's a lot that can affect us. But today, when we remember Christ, when we do the things in his memory, let's allow that to go to our heart. And the other side of that coin is what comes from our heart affects what ends up in our mind. So as opposed to telling you to remember Christ today, I'm going to ask you where your heart is. Where's your heart? All too often it gets caught up in the busyness of this life. Sometimes it gets caught up in the cracker and the juice. Where's your heart? Is it focused on the body and the blood and the fact that God did for us what we didn't deserve, what we really had no part in doing for ourselves because of his love? That's what should be in our heart. Let's pray together. Our Father, our God, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be here and all the things, Father, that focus our mind, our thoughts on you. We pray, Father, as we do that, you would continue to grow in our hearts. That we would open our hearts and allow you to be there continuously. Whether we stand around this table and in, in these emblems to remember you or whether we're in the rat race of life. Help us, Father, to know that we can keep you in our heart. But at this time, Father, we're grateful for this bread that represents the body of your son. We're so thankful for that body and what it, what it means to us, Father, and, and what was accomplished in your will when you allowed your son to hang on that cross in our stead. Help us, Father, as we think on this bread, we consume this bread, that our hearts would be drawn closer to you and more like Christ who died for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Father, our God, as we do continue our prayer, help it to come from our hearts. As we remember 
the precious blood that was shed for us on Calvary's cross. We're grateful for this emblem, this fruit of the vine that represents that blood and the opportunity to again remember that sacrifice. Remember the love that was pouring out on that cross. Remember the price that was paid through the shedding of that blood. And especially, Father, to remember your love and the redemptive power that that blood provides for us. Be with us, Father, as we partake. Help it to change our hearts. Help it to renew your spirit within us that it may not only affect us now, but every day of our lives. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. As we change our attention now to typically the physical things that we think of, we're, we're grateful for the spiritual blessings that Christ has given us. But in this moment when we have an opportunity to think about what God has given us, Rick's lesson today is on dangerous prayers, and I don't, I don't know what that's going to talk about, but I'm going to say a prayer that I think would fit that category today. When we think about the material things that consume us in this life, are those things controlling us? Or are those things under our control and we're using them to glorify God who gave them to us? Many opportunities to be able to give. Many of you probably already done that, but let's pray together now as, as we think about the blessings he gives us. Father God, we're so grateful for everything that you do in our lives. And as, as physical beings, we often dwell and focus on the things of this life. We are blessed, Father. We are truly physically blessed. But aside from the physical blessings, Father, we know that through Christ Jesus, we have and we can do all things spiritually. We're so grateful for that. But on the physical realm, Father, we pray that you would be with us. Help us to have the right heart as it relates to the money, the talents, the abilities. Even the air that we breathe is yours, Father. And help us to use it to glorify you, Father. And if it's an obstacle that we struggle with, my prayer is that you would remove these things. Cause us to suffer. Cause us to realize that these things are so temporary. And when we can't have them or don't have them, we still have you. And you have us. Guide us, Father. Fill our hearts with your love. Not love of things, but the love of you. We thank you again for Jesus who makes it all possible. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Briscoe in his book, Getting to Know God, mentioned there that there are basically three types of prayers that we often use to petition God. Please prayers, thank you prayers, and I'm sorry prayers. If we're honest with ourselves and we think about our own prayer life, chances are most of the prayers that we offer to God are those type of prayers. Prayers that I call safe prayers. There's not a lot of risk in, in asking God those type of things. But this morning, I'm gonna ask you to step out of your comfort zone, if you will. And I want us to think about a type of prayer that if we find the courage to pray, will radically change our lives. I want us to think about a dangerous prayer. Now, a dangerous prayer is not one asking God to put us in a dangerous situation. A dangerous prayer is a bold prayer. It's a prayer that completely surrenders ourselves to God. It's not a prayer about ruining your life. But if God does answer it, it will certainly upend your life. I think the Bible's filled with such prayers. This morning, we want to look at one from Psalms 139. I invite you to open your Bibles there if you choose to. You can follow along on the screens if you like. But we take one of David's prayers to use this morning as an example of a dangerous prayer. David was someone who wanted to stand approved in the sight of God. David was concerned about his relationship with God to the point that he did not want anything to get in the way of that relationship. And to accomplish that, he knew that he had to grant God permission to do some things in his life. And so he prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. 
Now, most of us at some point in time in our life understand what it's like to be evaluated. Maybe that happened in the high school speech class. Or perhaps it's during that tryout for the team or the band or whatever. Or maybe it's that yearly performance evaluation that we have at work. But we've all faced some sort of evaluation. How did that make you feel? Again, if we're honest, for most of us, those situations make us feel a little anxious. Imagine asking God, the creator of all things, the one who knows all things, sees all things, asking God to take a peek into your heart and mind, to purposefully make myself vulnerable to God, to open myself up to the Almighty. This type of dangerous prayer expresses a willingness to be laid completely bare before the Father. To invite God in for an evaluation and an examination of my life. Every thought of my mind, every inclination of my heart, every intention of my actions. Now to digest all of this, let's break down the prayer. The prayer that David prayed. What is it that I'm really asking God to do? I'm asking God to search my heart. Now for some of you, you may be thinking, why? Why would I ask God to do that? I have a good heart. You have a good heart. We all got good hearts, right? You remember what the prophet said. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things. Desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? One Greek scholar said this, nothing is so easy as to deceive oneself for what we wish we readily believe. Now don't raise your hand or indicate in any way, but have you ever told a lie? That's kind of a trick question, isn't it? <laughs> the truth is that we're all guilty of self-deception. And maybe the most prevalent lie that we tell is the one we tell about ourselves. And the one that we tell to ourselves. We tell ourselves that we're good with God when we're nowhere near that. We echo the words of Jesus in Matthew 15 when he said, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And the danger we need to realize is that we can fool ourselves into thinking that we're right where God wants us to be when we really know we're close. And the thing we've got to understand is this. There's a big difference between doing church and being the church. You remember those folks in Matthew 7? They thought they had done some things that were pretty impressive. But Jesus said to them, I never knew you. Here's the incredible thing about this prayer. God will reveal some things about yourself that maybe you are not willing to acknowledge on your own. Deep things, hidden things, the inner thoughts of your heart. God exposes things in your heart to bring us into a deeper intimacy with him. And maybe that's why we're reluctant to pray the prayer because we're not ready to face the truth about ourselves. We just as soon believe the lie. The second thing I'm asking to do is to expose my fears. There were two explorers out in the, on a jungle safari. And suddenly they were approached by a ferocious lion. One of them said to the other, hey, just stay calm. Remember the book we read. If we're approached by a lion, we just stand still, we just stare at it, and 
it'll go on and leave us alone. His buddy looked at him and said, yeah, that sounds good. You read the book and I read the book, but did the lion read the book? <laughs> Look, there's probably no other time in history than we've been faced with more fears and more concerns than we are right now. What is it that makes you anxious? I'm not talking about lizards and bugs. I'm talking about deep down internally, what makes you anxious? The future? The unknown? The uncertainty? Why would I ask God to reveal my anxious thoughts? Because what we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. And our lives are filled with all sorts of stressors. Financial, relational, emotional, physical. And here lies the power of the prayer. By facing our fears or our anxieties, we put our focus on God. We take our focus off the stressors. The psalmist said this, the Lord is my light, my salvation. So why should I be afraid? Isaiah said, don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you and I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. 160 times in scripture, we are told, do not be afraid. And almost every single time after it says that is a revelation of the presence of God. If we're bold enough to pray this prayer, then we're forced with the decision to take the focus off of the fear and put our focus on God. We're also asking God to uncover my sin. It takes an enormous amount of courage to say to God, God, search my heart. It takes even more courage to say to God, expose my fears. But asking God to uncover my sin is a whole new level of courage. Show me, God, anything in my life that is inconsistent with you. God, show me anything in my life that I am doing that's offensive to you. Show me anything that is displeasing to you. Why? Have you noticed the further you go in this prayer, the more courage we need? Have you ever noticed how hard it is for us to face our own failures in the mirror? Look at the prayer again. Search me, O oh God, know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. Put out anything in me that offends you. It's natural for us to find ways to cover our sin opposed to uncovering. Well, you know, that's just the way I am. That's how I was raised. That's my personality. And in our minds, there's this ongoing sin that I figure that I just have to live with. Or there's the one that, that I pretend that's it's really not a problem. Or the occasional sin that I, I, I pretend this was just a one-time thing. It probably won't happen again. And the further we go into the prayer, the deeper the examination goes. And here's the hard questions we got to ask. What have I rationalized in my life? What is it in my life right now that I've told myself it's not a big deal, but it really is? What am I the most offensive about? 
One of the things that I've learned over the years of ministry is this. People get real defensive when you talk about things that deep down inside they know they shouldn't be doing. They're doing them anyway. I, lo I love the story of the golden calf. You remember in Exodus? Children of Israel have been delivered out of bondage. They're out there in the wilderness. And Moses goes up on the mountain. He's up there talking to God. He's up there getting a handwritten copy of the Ten Commandments. Now he's gone for a little while, and the people begin to complain, and they begin to grumble and whatnot. And when Moses finally comes back, he discovers that they have made a golden calf. And he asks the question in amazement, what, what is this? What happened? awkward silence finally Aaron speaks up and he said well you know the people were grumbling they were upset and I said well bring me all your gold and so they brought all their gold we threw it in the fire and guess what oh, golden calf another moment of awkward silence between two brothers Moses Hulk smashes the Ten Commandments goes on a rage. There's a Levi posse. People end up eating the ground up tablets of stone. There's a lot of lessons there. There's a lot of things we could make with that this morning. But the application for us is this, that we'll make up almost any excuse for our behavior. And this prayer will make us stop making excuses for the way we are and the way we live and the way we act. It'll point out things that we've been trying to explain away for years, things that we've just been in denial about. And hear me, church, when that happens, it leads to confession, that leads to repentance, that leads to forgiveness, that leads to healing. John would tell us in 1 John, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. David is inviting God to shine his pure light into his life, into the recesses of his life, where all the sin hides. If you want to be holy, not just outwardly where we can fake it, but inwardly, we have to consistently and constantly confront our sin. That's why this prayer is a game changer. Because it points out our need for Jesus, our need for grace, our need for healing. And finally, we ask God, lead my ways. Search me, O oh God, and know my way, heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. I think this is a surrender statement. God, now that you've searched my heart, now that you have exposed me, now that you have uncovered things about me that I know I need to change, God, lead me in a way that will do that. And here lies the beauty of the prayer. After God searches our heart, after he exposes those things, after he shows us where we need to change, he actually wants to help us to get where we want to be. Whether that's building a better marriage, whether that's raising godly kids, and whether that's growing spiritually, whether that's getting to heaven. The wise man said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. You remember geometry class? The straightest distance between two points is what? Straight. straight line. Straight line. So the best route that any of us can take in our lives is middle of the road. 
with God leading us. So as we close this morning, there's something that you need to know. There's something that you need to understand. If somehow you have the courage to pray this prayer, God will answer it. He'll search your heart. He expose you. He will uncover the sin. But the beautiful thing is he will lead you to healing. Maybe some of you have prayed this prayer. Maybe he's done that. Maybe you realize the need to surrender your life. Confess your faith in him. Be baptized and find that cleansing blood. What are you waiting for? Maybe for others, we need to confess. We need to repent. We need to find healing. What are you waiting for? Elders will be in the back and I will be down front while you decide. Let's all stand and sing.